Hello, everybody. We're the people are still filtering in. So I'd like to start promptly, but um, might take a, another minute for a few people to come in. Okay, I'm going to get us started before it gets too late because I know that we cover a lot of a lot of material, a lot of many years and many miles too. Um, and thank you everyone so far for joining us this evening. We have I'm so happy to have Anastasia back um, with us to uh, update us on what is happening in Ukraine now and also with some uh, fascinating parts about uh, Ukrainian history too and culture. Um, for uh, the little administrative notes, please add any questions you have to the Q&A and if I don't get to your question, please remind me because sometimes I do miss a question. And if you have any ideas or resources or something that doesn't fit into the into a question concept, please add that to the chat. We'll add some other resources to that the chat also that you might find helpful. Um, and uh, again, like I said, the, thank you. My name is Larissa Brooks. I'm a librarian here at the Ridgewood Public Library. And um, last March, Anastasia Bard came to talk to us about uh, what was happening in Ukraine and why. And uh, at the time, I naively thought that we would need to have a follow up like this. Um, but I'm very sad that we have to and also very glad that um, Anastasia is here to talk with us and answer our questions. Um, she, I think, covered probably um, the largest expanse of history in the shortest amount of time um, in the beginning of our last discussion. Um, and uh, she is exceptionally talented and they're just the best person that we could have to do this kind of program because, well, she was born in Kiev, uh, Ukraine, and she immigrated to the immigrated to the United States when she was 14. She grew graduated from NYU um, with a major in broadcast journalism, and she's worked in that field for 20 years. Um, her experience includes ABC, Good Morning America, Sunday, NBC Dateline, um, and the NBC News International Desk. The last two years before she became a freelancer, she, um, and uh, concentrating on her family and starting another business, um, she worked as a head of the foreign news department at Fox News Channel. She has traveled as a field journalist to many locations, including Iraq in 2004. So she has been to um, war zones. And she, now she has her own company. She started a, an after school enrichment company um, called the World Explorer. Explorers Club, which to, um, also runs programs here at the library. She was just at the library yesterday um, running a program on Indonesia. Um, she's uh, been a resident of, New of Ridgewood for uh, 10 years with her husband, Konstantin, um, who was born in Kharkiv, one of the area's hardest hit in the war, um, and along with their two teenage daughters. Um, so I will let, I'm going to put myself on mute and I will let um, Anastasia um, tell us. Uh, um, and also, we have other few questions that um, some people had already posted, so we'll get to those at the very end. But she's going to Anastasia is going to speak for a little while, like last time, and then um, she'll get to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Brooks. I'm so happy to be here, and also um, sad that we have to follow up. But it looks like the story is going to be a long one. Um, so it's important to stay educated and I'm happy to share what I know, of course, and um, also to, always happy to learn myself. So just to sort of do a very quick review of the 2000 years we covered last time, we talked about how the early Slavs settled and stayed in the region that is now Ukraine along the rivers and how they were initially pagans who believed in um, these um, polytheistic 
religion, but then Christianity was brought to Ukraine from Byzantine Empire and slowly, you know, big cities were developed. So it was very early on at the time when Western Europe, there was uh, very little literacy, but in Kyiv, Ukraine, it became a very large city, quite successful army as well as very advanced education. And Kyiv and Rus was sort of the dominating area for early Slavs. At the time when Kyiv was a big city, this is what Moscow looked like. Okay, well, this is a drawing. It's not a picture, a photograph, but in 10th century, Moscow was a very small village, um, which was actually a private village that eventually, because of its uh, very um, advantageous location, became a um, financially successful town. But, you know, Kyiv at that time, this is a sort of 3D diorama from a museum. It was a huge city with many churches, a big fortress, um, was well known on any European economic route, like many traders came from east to west through this city to trade and to bring their goods. So just historically, Ukraine was quite advanced. Unfortunately, the Mongol invasion had set it back and Kiev was completely or almost completely destroyed. Meanwhile, smaller towns were able to prosper. And in 14th century, Moscow takes the lead, right? There were other cities that were capitals, you can say, of Russia prior to Moscow. But Moscow takes the lead in 14th century, it becomes very rich. And the princes of Russia made it their seat of power. It was not yet really an empire, but slowly small different um, Russian, um, I guess, states united together. And Ivan the Terrible was the first Tsar of Russia, right? So slowly from 16th century all the way to the um, revolution of 1917, the Russian empire grew conquering many lands, including what is now Poland, but used to be Russia, and certainly as far east as Japan. Um, Ukraine remained a, a territory controlled by Russia. So one of the Russian emperors who created sort of the biggest uh, challenge for Ukraine to keep their, its identity was Catherine the Great. She was in charge of creating the new um, territory called New Russia. It included the southern lands of Ukraine as well as Crimea. She made her ex-boyfriend, the ruler of that region, a very talented man called Patyomkin. And uh, it was very, very rich lands, very successful. You know, Crimea was developed. It was taken away from the Turks and made a Russian territory. So it was not even Ukrainian to begin with, right? It was Turkish territory that was forcibly made to be new Russia. Um, and only after the revolution of 1917, when the civil war began, for a short period of time, Ukraine gained its independence. Ukrainians did not want to be part of Soviet Russia. And for about two, three years, they had what was trying to become an independent country. Now, Russian Soviet Union was way too powerful. The Russian army uh, won the civil war and all of these pink territories we see on the map became part of Soviet Union. And one of the, um, I guess, very um, important for these union uh, strategies was making sure there was only one culture to be followed, the Soviet culture. It wasn't even so much about being Russian, it was about being Soviet. So what whoever was in Ukraine had to stop worrying about being Ukrainian and have stopped worrying to be a good Soviet citizen. Uh, after the first uh, Soviet leader, Lenin, was assassinated, this man came to power. You might recognize the picture of Joseph Stalin. And he is quite famous for many different very uh, terrible things that he had done but one of them was also forcing Ukrainian farmers to give up their land and work as a collective work for the state which and also confiscating the grain that they were able to grow so pictures like this were posted everywhere across Soviet Union to um, sell the idea is that don't work for yourself, 
right? Don't believe those who own the land before you. Work for the state, do it together, and create these collective farms. They were called Kol Hoz, which is really the abbreviation. Kol for collective and Hoz for, um, you know, working together. So these collective farms, it was a propaganda idea sold and forced all across the Soviet Union, but nowhere strongly, as strongly as in Ukraine, because Ukraine, just because of its territory, how far south it is, how incredibly rich the uh, earth is, it was always um, a farming land, always the land where people would um, worry about growing things and then selling things. That was the main idea of pretty much any Ukrainian family. They were very close to the land. And suddenly Soviet um, government says, no, actually all this land belongs to the Soviet Union and all that grain that you've been growing, you now have to send to Moscow. It wasn't just Moscow, but I'm sort of simplifying it. And again, propaganda in Soviet Union always worked beautifully. Like these were the posters that said, anyone who's a landowner who doesn't work for a collective farm is what's called a, uh, a fist, right? This is the word in Russian called kulak, a fist. So they say, get rid of the fists, those guys who are looking out for themselves, right? They're not going to look out for the regular people. So uh, a lot of people who before had small pieces of land or large pieces of land suddenly became the bad guys unless, of course, they would join the collective farms. So anyone who would say, no, I want to work for myself, turned out that that wasn't part of the party line. And it was a, a definitely either, pun they were either, either punished or um, somehow persecuted, whether it was physically by putting them in jail or just making them economically um, poorer by confiscating things. So. In the period between 1929 and 30, in 1933, uh, Stalin's orders were to remove as much grain as possible from Ukraine. So yes, there was a small drought, but there was also an order to have quotas for these Ukrainian farmers and Ukrainian collective um, sort of unions that had to give up all the, almost all the grain that they grew. People would hide grain underground to dig it up during the night to try to find something to eat because this policy of removing the grain, of forcing this collective farming and also having quotas created one of the worst famines that was ever that ever existed in the Soviet Union. And another terrible thing that Stalin had done, he never admitted to it. The Soviet government never admitted to what is known as Holodomor this starvation that took the lives of more than 4 million people, maybe even more, but those are pretty, um, I guess, conservative numbers that are used um, around the world. Some are saying it could have been, you know, tens of millions, but even after the first year of famine, when the party um, officials came to Stalin, and this is all documented in uh, Soviet archives that have been opened and said, there's millions of people dying, maybe we should stop. Maybe we need to reverse this five-year plan of removing the grain. Uh, Stalin said, stay the course, do not change anything. And few more years of famine had continued. So over time, both the famine as well as ideology and propaganda had succeeded in making Ukraine definitely a Soviet Ukrainian Republic. Like it was no longer fighting for its independence as much. It became part of Soviet Union and communism became the main idea, the main ideology of the state. And unfortunately, and I'm gonna stop sharing just for a second, um, I can say that just by creating the Soviet Union ideology and the communist ideology, the central line for everyone, they succeeded in making anything Ukrainian, anything es ethnic, and it's existed in other republics as well, some sort of like second class. Like I grew up in Ukraine, I went to school until eighth grade in Kiev, and there were two different schools that we had to go to. There was a Russian school or Ukrainian school that you could go to in every area of this big city um and wh which ones do you think were fancier and the ones you want to get into so the russian schools were always had better teachers always had better education i'm talking about big cities i'm not talking about villages um so it was more um 
you know, you if you went to Ukrainian school, you must have been like uh, someone who was not cool enough or perhaps didn't have connections. So people uh, in the government had succeeded by making Ukrainian culture less cool, even for the kids. I remember thinking, oh, well, I suppose it's those peasants who speak Ukrainian. We in the capital speak Russian. Like this is, was part of what my thinking was. I'm not talking about other people. Unfortunately, I can admit to that now. I lost my Ukrainian language because I didn't practice it anywhere, but only like one or two hours in school. Once I moved to the United States, I stayed with um, continuing some of my Russian culture and I speak Russian now and understand Ukrainian, but I lost it. So this is how successful anti-Ukrainian propaganda was at every level from child, from children in school. And it started in kindergarten, probably in preschool and then continue on through the adulthood. So now that we have talked about how the Soviet Union, starting with Stalin, actually starting with Lenin, but we focused on Stalin and the famine, have succeeded in making um, the Soviet sort of culture the main one for Ukrainian citizens, where the Ukrainian culture and language still flourished, but in sort of more removed centers, in smaller villages, in Western Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine and big cities like number one and two cities, Kyiv and Kharkiv were very Russian and Russian language was probably the primary one when I was born and when I lived there in the 80s. But when the Soviet Union fell apart, things have changed. So I wanted to touch on a little bit like why did the Soviet Union fall apart? Like what brought about these changes that eventually led to the independence of Ukraine? But one of the first things was Chernobyl disaster, the nuclear disaster in 1986, which happened 30 miles, or I think it's actually 30 kilometers away from Kiev, from the capital. And I was there when it happened. The Communist Party tried to cover it up instead of caring and taking care of its people. So the disaster happened on April 26. The regular people in Kiev and in other towns didn't know about it until it showed up in the Western press until it came as a news from Western Europe saying, oh, we have higher uh, radiation levels in Sweden and in Norway, what is going on? Because the wind switched and went that way. So Ukrainian officials would not admit to this disaster for at least two weeks. Only then towards the middle of May is when people started realizing, oh my God, we have to leave. Otherwise everyone's going to get sick. So that made a lot of people very angry. The other reason the Soviet Union was um, something that was a lot sort of having trouble with the trust of its citizens is the Soviet Afghan war. Soviet Union got involved in Afghanistan and for 10 years waged, waged a very unsuccessful war against um, the Afghan soldiers. And by 1989, they had to pull out. Of course, they tried to save face and say that, no, we didn't lose the war. But if you sort of overall big picture now, it was definitely a loss. A lot of Russian soldiers from all parts of Soviet Union uh, were killed and people were angry. Why were we there in the first place? Well, unfortunately, this is the case in many military conflicts that any country can get in, you know, involved in. But again, the party had lost the confidence of the people because of how they handled Chernobyl, because of how they handled the Afghan war. And of course, there was the fall of Berlin and Berlin Wall. So there was this movement of democracy all over Eastern Europe. Some other countries that used to be um, very obedient to the Soviet Union, like Eastern Germany and some other countries around it, said, no, 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 we don't like the communist way anymore. We want to change things. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but at the same time, this is the gist of what had happened. So the lastly, and probably most important as it is for any country, the economy in the Soviet Union, USSR, was tanking. It was briefly sort of came up a little bit in the 70s, but then again, there were big lines for anything. There were shortages of uh, certain goods, Sometimes things would show up in stores and disappear and be sold out within a day. Like this is a line to buy bread. You know, in a country which has such fertile land, it just was bad management in many ways. So by 1991, the Soviet Union falls apart. And within a few months, 
Ukraine gains its independence. It took a few months, and this is just a picture sort of reminds us to uh, how the tanks rolled on Red Square, right, to um, get rid of the communist government. And Boris Yeltsin came to power promising reforms and economic reforms and all kinds of freedoms. But in Ukraine, from 1992 to 2022 to now, right, so we're looking at 30 years, there were small and big steps, sometimes two steps forwards, one step back. But overall, for 30 years, the country has been moving towards the West. Now, sometimes Russian Federation was too busy with its own problems and kind of paid attention a little less but sometimes it paid a lot more attention. For example, in 2004, there was an election and the man on the left, whose name, last name is Yanukovych, which you may or may not recognize, but he was uh, what we may say is a crony of Vladimir Putin, listened and was pro to listen to everything Putin had to say and was a pro-Russian candidate. He almost became the president of Ukraine. Didn't work out, but later he became the prime minister during the rule of another president. So he was always somewhere near the power, never left. In 2010, Yanukovych finally succeeds and he was elected the president of Ukraine. According to Western observers, uh, that election was, um, was not stolen. It was definitely people had voted for him. But within a few years, Yanukovych's policies were so constantly moving Ukraine towards Russia and further away from Europe. He couldn't quite do it openly, but in November 2013, the people took to the main square in Kiev because Yanukovych said, we're not going to join EU economic um, reforms. We're not going to sign an agreement with EU economically. We're going to align with Russia instead. But everyone was shocked. No one wanted this. And the first 2,000 people who came out were mostly young people who were college students because they realized Yanukovych is about to steal our economic future. He wants to continue the old way of doing things, right? The bureaucracy that's never going to change while we want to travel to Europe and to you know, create our own new companies and create our own future and be in charge of that instead of lose it and align ourselves with Putin. These were kids who by now lived in an independent Ukrainian state uh, since 1992. They were not interested in joining the union with Russia. So the college kids went into the square and um, pretty much said what they thought about this deal that Yanukovych was trying to force on the country. Um, but in that part of the world, unfortunately, the force is usually used to break up demonstrations, to stop people from using their right to speak. So the college kids got beat up. I'm not sure that this is a college kid getting beat up, but I just wanted a visual to show and I'm going to mention a documentary you can watch if you want to learn more and see the real footage. So the um, state police controlled by Yanukovych's party, they were called Berkut, um, they had beat up these kids in the main square, which brought huge protests out. Now it's the fathers of those college kids who got so upset. How dare you beat up our children? Not just, not only try to steal our economic future, but also do this against very young boys and girls. Um, the uprising just wouldn't die off. For three months in the middle of winter, and we're talking about, you know, minus uh, Celsius uh, temperatures. For three months, people wouldn't leave the square. They actually barricaded themselves. And unfortunately, um, the state police brought out snipers and all kinds of force was used against the protesters. Ultimately, more than 100 protesters were killed, 13 police, and there's still a memorial to those people who were fighting for the freedom, who said, we realize we're likely to die but we're not leaving because the moment we leave the square um, the party will continue what they're doing they were demanding three things one was 
definitely the resi resignation of the president. They wanted new elections to be called and they wanted all um, forced to, to end against the protesters. So if you want to watch more about the specific events from the winter of 2013, 2014 of how things developed and um, it, it's not an easy documentary to watch for anyone who is from Ukraine. Um, I don't recommend watching it before, you know, going to sleep, but um, it was definitely an eye-opening experience, even for me who knew the big picture, but this gives a lot of details about who were the players and um, how they got involved and how it all developed and definitely explains why Ukraine, since that March of 2014, and then the elections were called, oh, oh by the way, and at the very end, uh, on the last day of the protest, Yanukovych got in his helicopter, took his suitcase full of gold and fled the country. And, you know, not without any surprise, he fled to Russia, uh, where we believe he still is. So now Ukrainians got what they wanted. They got their voice heard. They eventually got their um, reforms and uh, alignment closer economically with EU. And Ukrainians became, I guess, an embarrassment for this man. So what does he do? Within the same year, later in 2014, Vladimir Putin orders the occupation of Crimea. And remember that uh, sort of brief mention of Catherine the Great and how her forces had long ago conquered Crimea from the Turks? Well, Putin said, well, you know, it was never Ukrainian, it was Russian since, ever since Catherine the Great's time. And the second thing that began is trouble in Donbass region. Like what is Donbass? Donbass, if you look at the map of Ukraine, is this area on the far east, right? It's probably the closest to Russia, to this land, part of Russia, and it's a very uh, rich, energy rich area. It has a lot of um, mines uh, to remove coal and definitely a place where there's a lot of workers uh, and it would be certainly a very good area for Russia to chop off from Ukraine in addition to Crimea. This is where the most fierce fighting is going on during this current war. So a lot of uh, analysts believe that in addition to just causing all kinds of destruction within Ukraine, what Putin's probably um, thinking is that he wants to take this whole area and connect the land bridge to Crimea. So to take control over Donbass, which already has separatist areas, but also to take a chunk of land between Donbass and Crimea. So basically to take away, I don't know, maybe one tenth of Ukraine's territory. Um, so in on February 24, uh, 2022, um, sorry, 23rd actually, uh, the war began with Ukraine. And I, I have to say, I actually was watching on CNN that night. It was probably around, I can't remember, around midnight when we saw the tanks roll in uh, from Russian territory into Ukraine. And my jaw and my husband's jaw, we were watching this. It was just, we couldn't believe it. Like there was a lot of people sort of saying it could happen, it could happen. Not, no Russian, Ukrainian, American in the United States would ever believe that this was possible. This is how close Russia and Ukraine in terms of cultural heritage and the friendship between the people always was. The governments didn't get along, but the people always did. So the, when the war began, uh, it was just a huge shock. But then when you start thinking about it, really, why was anyone surprised, right? Because Russia has done this before. If you think about it, uh, Aleppo, Syria, yes, the Russian forces have leveled and destroyed a whole city in Syria, helping Putin's friend, now uh, the president of Syria. And there was another example from history that also did, uh, something similar has happened. Chechnya is a small region near the Black Sea, next to the border of Georgia which wanted to fight for its own independence. Again, the capital was leveled. And just like even, I mean, I understand these are sort of images that were picked for uh, the reason that they are so similar, but Chechnya in 2000, 
and Ukraine in 2022. The same playbook, the same examples, the same bombing of big cities, bombing of residential areas that perhaps are of no reason and no interest. I understand that there's a military um, sort of installation you want to take, but this is on the map where Chechnya is, just in case you're curious. It's at this very southern sort of edge of Russia as it's on the edge of um, Georgia between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. That's Anastasia, I think we're losing you. But if we are- I think we just strong. lost you for a little bit, Anastasia. Okay. Hi, I am Agnes. Repeat that last bit. Yes, of course, of course. I apologize for any trouble. I don't see any reason for it on my end, but all right. As I was saying, if we're going back to Ukraine, here's a map of where most of the fighting has been going on in the last um, four months. It's now four and a half months since the war has started. There's two sort of fronts that were uh, initially init started. It was the Northern front, right? When the Russian forces were trying to make it to Kiev to the capital, they have now backed off. Kiev seems to be more or less stable. There's sometimes bombs falling there, but a lot less now. I mean, my dad is in Kiev. I talk to him every day. So they're, I used to it. They do have sirens every single day. Um, just recently, there was an apartment building and a um, shopping center bombed, and there were dozens of you know, casualties. But comparing to what is going on in other cities, it's pretty much nothing like you, you it's, it's even hard to speak of that as a terrible thing going on because here we are the city number two Kharkiv the city of two million people uh, this is a city uh, where Russians would travel across the border to come to nightclubs to come to restaurants that's how first of all close they are and how wonderful the city is um, well now it is largely destroyed and I'll show you pictures in a moment Donbass area in the east, some cities are completely destroyed. Mariupol has been um, surrounded. And I, I think when we find out the number of people who have died there, it will be just like a, you know, a massacre that people will speak about, but the full numbers are not out yet. Um, it's very, 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 it's a humanitarian disaster at the, at the moment, but there's many smaller cities in this area that are facing the same fate. Um, another very important city on the Black Sea that you see here, Odessa. Odessa is actually kind of like uh, locked in right now because Ukrainians put a lot of mines in this uh, harbor, but all the cities around Crimea are facing a lot of bombing. There's a small city next to Odessa that's been in the news a lot, uh, Mykolaiv. And this map shows where the bombs have been falling. So most bombs are landing in the east uh, and the south. The west where you see around Lviv or Lutsk, it's very few. It's always a big surprise when something falls in the west of Ukraine. But cities near uh, Kharkiv, in Mariupol and some of those cities in the east, the distraction is just devastating. Um, and some territories have been gained back. The Ukrainian military have fought back and they have made small gains. I mean, think of it as David and Goliath. It's, there's no way for Ukraine to fully win this war. They're just too small. I mean, their military is uh, used to be you know, 200,000. Now, certainly there's a lot of volunteers. But all those yellow areas that you see on the map, uh, not, not the circles, those are reclaimed territory. So Ukrainians are pushing back. And I think the Russians figured out maybe we should try to hold on to less, but actually hold on to it. So they've been digging their heels in the area that you can see as Russian control, those red stripes. Uh, and some areas, unfortunately, they're advancing in. So as I was saying before, what I think is there in most people think the Russian strategy is to take this area in the east and the south and just perhaps annex it. And of course, Ukraine is not going to stand for that. So the fighting in this area will 
will go on. Um, the demonstrations continue, fighting continues, but it's a very complex issue where like, look at this street. This is Kharkiv, right? So Kharkiv is getting bombed every single day. Uh, if you look at this building, this is the city hall, right? And next picture is going to show you the city hall now. Right, so this is the center of number two city in the country. It's very hard to believe. Meanwhile, and in um, in big cities like Kiev or Western cities, life goes on as if, well, not that as if nothing is happening, but people are continuing their lives. They're going to work. They are um, going to stores and restaurants. Obviously everyone's upset and there and so many people are helping, but there's a lot of almost discontent between the east of the country and the west of the country, right? Because uh, there's such a disconnect in the quality of life and the just daily uh, danger that they're facing. So that's one of the big, big challenges right now is how do you uh, survive the war in the war-torn area and how do people relate to it from the area that's not so advanced? And obviously the big challenge is that people in Russia, had they known the truth, had they known exactly what's going on instead of listening to the state propaganda I and mean, there's no independent media right now in Russia, everything has been swallowed up. The protesters are in the single digits, perhaps in hundreds since the beginning of the war. So the information in Russia either is not coming out or coming out in very small doses and um, the protests against the war are just way too small for a change to occur. I found this picture online and it just made me think, I'm like, this is what people are probably going to think about Vladimir Putin in about 50 years, that he had continued this communist party line that the first two pictures are Marx and Engels, yeah, the, the ph communist philosophers used by uh, Russian communist ideologists. And Lenin is number three, number four is Stalin, and Vladimir Putin will be remembered as their follower. Um, so how does... How far will Putin want to you know, stretch his imperial ambitions? It's hard to say. If he succeeds in Ukraine, it's very possible that he'll want to continue and gain back all those territories that he has an excuse to call Russian. Even Finland. Finland, during the rule of Peter the Great and after, big territories belong to Russia. So can he go and say, oh, well, we're going to use that too as uh, reclaim our own territory? Poland, huge territories in Poland used to be under the Russian control. So there's all these areas which are currently now independent. Who knows how far that ambition will go? So there's a lot of uh, speculation that his health may not be great, that he's trying to leave a mark, make sure he is not forgotten. Well, he certainly will never be forgotten in Ukraine. He is, um, or in, by many other people in Eastern Europe as well, because a lot of people in, the, in Latvia, Lithuania, in Estonia are afraid that they might be next. And just to find sort of the latest numbers, just to update us, and again, I don't know, is 5,000 people killed? Is that a lot or is that not enough? You know, when you think of a war, do you think of 100,000 killed? For me, having come from Ukraine, it's really hard to think of any civilians, any kids killed because there, these are 5,000 civilians that are probably by this date that the numbers have reached. And there is at least 5,000 soldiers that I'm taking the most conservative American sources. I'm not taking any Ukrainian sources, right? I'm trying to be as impartial and as uh, sort of straightforward here as I can, no emotions, but 12 million people of 44 million residents in Ukraine have fled their homes and 5 million have left Ukraine and moved to Europe and other countries. So that's 10% of the population. So the numbers are pretty, pretty uh, telling, right? So even if you just use the UN numbers, not some others. Actually, um, Anastasia, could you put that into context with the uh, population numbers for Ukraine? Yes, so the population of Ukraine uh, before the war was 44 million people. So if you subtract 5 million who have left, so it's now 39 million. And again, these are conservative numbers. The numbers keep growing. A lot of people keep leaving. 
so that will continue growing. And a lot of people are displaced within Ukraine, meaning that they have left their homes in the East. And some of them said, we're not gonna leave the country, but we have to move because we have kids or elderly or whoever, and we have to move and uh, live in the Western part of Ukraine, which is a lot less affected. And is the Western part, I mean, is it like a parallel universe kind of? I mean, is it, uh, can people imagine what's going on in either, like in the, in the West, do they? Well, they certainly see it from television, right? Because the press in Ukraine is not controlled by the state. There's independent media. There aren't any pro-Russian channels as far as I know. So, you know, they may or may not all be um, happy with Zelensky, who is the current president of Ukraine. But I think overall, and I don't watch Ukrainian television, so I don't know for a fact, but uh, I think overall people are pleased with his leadership because he hadn't left and he stayed and he was trying to um, use diplomacy very effectively by um, reaching out to world leaders, asking for help. So basically, if you're asking like, is it a different universe? No, but is the culture different? Yes. So you think of like Western Ukraine, more like uh, south of United States, maybe like Texas or Kentucky, slightly in culture, culture wise. Um, and then you also have Kiev, which is more like New York to me, right? More cosmopolitan city. And then you have the east of Ukraine, which maybe is more like Maine or, um, you know, I don't know, Massachusetts. They're slightly more reserved, more northern people. But it's not a huge country. It's not as drastic of a change, but these are sort of the analogies I can draw for us to relate to. You know, when you mentioned also about Georgia, I was wondering if um, I was thinking about the how like how did Georgia fit, like what is its state status right now regarding Putin? Because they went through something that's not. I mean, it was definitely not as brutal as what's going on right now, but something similar. Yeah, the, Georgia is an independent country. Always has been since the fall of the Soviet Union, but. Um, they also had government that was pro-Russian for a period of time and the similar situation where the reforms were not the reform, the, the reforms the government wanted to do were not aligned with the interests of the people. So there was what was called a Rose Revolution. Ukraine had Orange Revolution, but Georgia was first. They had a Rose Revolution and they had also removed the pro-Russian government and they were able to make some changes. Now, Again, I'm not an expert on Georgia, but they are very much in support of Ukraine. They are afraid they will also be next. Actually, if you think of uh, the countries who are trying to enter NATO, there are three who want to, and it's Georgia, it is Ukraine, and I think it's Bosnia, uh, Bosnia but I'm, I'm, don't, don't quote me on this. Um, so Georgia would love to enter NATO and have the protection against Russia, but they're not likely to be admitted just like Ukraine because of the challenges in diplomacy. Um, but as far as the sentiment of the people, they're not pro-Russian, they're pro-Ukrainian. And the government has always been sort of trying to walk this line. Like you have this very powerful bear of a neighbor like Russia, you can't openly be against it because guess what happens when you're openly against, you get invaded. So it's, it's a challenging uh, political situation. And it's interesting to see that uh, Putin does seem to reward, like I think about Chechnya or Belarus. Um, he absolutely almost like you can you can be like me, uh, a totalitarian dictator in your own region. Absolutely, if you go along with in, in Chechnya, there is what what a lot of people call a puppet government, meaning the Chechen president, as as he's called. He is definitely following the advice and sometimes orders of uh, the Russian government. The Belarusian president, who we used to be called the only dictator in Europe, I don't think we can only call him the only one anymore, but Lukashenko has been in power. My goodness, I don't even know how many years, but I mean, I have a friend here in the United States whose sister was a journalist in Belarus and she's in jail. She's in jail because uh, what she said and what she was reporting was not aligned with the party. So it is a definitely a dictatorship state. And to some extent, I think Belarusia is a little scared now 
because there, there's a lot of sort of news reports that um, Belarusian reserve soldiers have been ordered to go in and get measured and like all these things. So now the Belarusians are afraid, will they be sent to fight in Ukraine? And even though they are obviously the country president supports Russia, it doesn't mean that the Belarusians want to go and fight inside Ukraine. So there's a lot of things going on all around Ukraine and certainly uh, with the people that Putin influences that are very challenging, not just for Ukraine or Russia, it's also for its neighbors. And I know I ask you these questions as if you know absolutely everything that is happening. I, I really, really don't. don't. So, <laughs> please, I really, I, I'm just so impressed by everything you know already. And I know that you it's just, we're very lucky. But um, but yeah, you can't know all of this. But when we saw the map first that showed where troops were moving in from Russia towards Ukraine, and you could see just like a little end, the southernmost end of Belarus above. And are they, so, and, and you said that they're, the Russia is just concentrating further east are there still troops on the belarus side or that is that i don't know i'm afraid i don't know the answer i know that russian troops had entered ukraine from the russian side but they were also using the territory of belarusia at some point whether they're there i don't know but i do know that that particular region from which they were coming was to aim at key the capital Within two months, Russians realized they're not going to take Kiev. There's too much defense there. So they had moved most of their troops east. So if I was to guess, and I don't know this for a fact, I would say that most of the troops have moved towards the east and away from that area. Okay. And I don't know if I interrupted you from anything else that you were saying. No, no, no. I mean, we were talking, I was answering questions. <sighs> Um, about, uh, let's say, oh yeah, I was wondering what uh, Yanukovych might have uh, been doing, but, um, and also you mentioned something about the uh, Soviet archives opening. I mean, you must be, it, it, and actually there've been so many fascinating stories that have been coming out of that, even about um, the Rosenberg trial um, in the United States um, during the Cold War, um, what, you know, who was really guilty there. Um, but has there been any more information? Do, do you know if there's been any more information that's come out about the um, Holodomor, like about... Uh, Holodomor, yes, but because mm -hmm. that's so long ago. But I would mm -hmm. say Putin has slowly been trying over time and definitely uh, making these flirtatious remarks about how democratic the government is. We have elections after all, right? But uh, at the same time, I think whatever was opened was in the beginning of Boris Yeltsin's rule and slowly has decreased that sort of stream of information has been closed off. So now Putin won't openly say that Joseph Stalin was a great leader but he's no longer allowing to trash his memory either. Like, because it's more advantageous to him to have the cult of strong leaders than it is to dismantle them, right? Because then who are they going to look at next? That's true, he's continuing this proud tradition. Um, but I should have mentioned Anne Applebaum has this uh, uh, unbelievably fantastic book that I have not, I've only read the first few pages so far. A red famine, I think, and of course it's available at the library. And I don't know if it's available online um, with Libby, but um, yeah, because I was wondering about if there's been any more. I thought it was really fascinating to hear about this uh, Ukrainian system of like during the Soviet Union of having these, you know, the um, the more favored Russian school versus the lesser, you know, stepchild um, Ukrainian school and. I, yeah, I was wondering if there's, it would be just be an interesting, that just sounds like a fascinating story too, because it seems, I mean, because you still have these um, other artifacts of pre-Soviet life, like you still had churches and, um, you know, those were not all to totally ripped down or burned yeah, down. Yeah, the churches, I remember having a church in, um, you know, that I, even my mother took me to, but it was never really a religious sort of place it was more of a cultural place like I remember looking at frescoes and my mom would say oh these are frescoes by so and so and I mean I know the names I just they wouldn't really mean much here but um so it was almost for artistic value more, more but again that's my family it doesn't mean that every family was like that I know in smaller towns religion continued and it was always important I think in cities 
the ideology mo mostly won out. And it's not, again, it's, I remember in my family, there were certain things that my grandfather would discuss with my mom, but I wasn't allowed to hear. And that was certainly not pro-government, right? But that you don't want the child to say something in school that they do not understand yet. So there was a lot of these things, sort of quiet conversations with an adult while the kids heard whatever the teachers were supposed to say. And then slowly as you were growing up, that's when your parents tell you, but you realize blah, 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 blah. But because I was, again, I left at 14. I don't remember having any eye-opening conversations with my family. It's like slowly you kind of figure that out on your own. Well, and that's, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but that's another fascinating story. Although those layers of oh, it's, uh, it's it's like incredible. strata of knowledge and understanding and just within your, I mean, your father alone, he's crossed, like had so many lives in his own lifetime. That yes, is it's, awareness. it's pretty, pretty amazing. It's, but which is why it is also so um, difficult to think of is really the lives of Russians and Ukrainians are so intertwined and so many families are, of mixed backgrounds, you know, and mixed different, like so many families here in the United States, you might come from Ukraine or you might come from Russia, but you meet in the United States and you might get married, right? It, it just so happened that my husband's also Ukrainian, but we're the kind of Ukrainians who speak Russian, right? So it's, I didn't marry a Ukrainian who speaks Ukrainian because that's just not my culture. Anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that had my husband been Russian and Russia invaded Ukraine, how difficult would that be within my family? And that's what's happening, not just in the United States, like where families are having tension, but also obviously inside Ukraine, where you have like your aunt or your grandfather or someone else in Russia, and they're listening to Russian television and telling you, no, no, there are no Russian bombs falling in Ukraine. So this is literally happening where people are saying, stop listening to number channel number one, that's the official channel in Russia. And like, look on the internet, but they, you know, older generation will not look on the internet. They will listen to the state television. So that's the trouble. Yeah. And I should, I mentioned this uh, last time that um, I, my mother is half Ukrainian and half Russian too, that, um, and I grew up thinking that uh, Ukrainian was just an, a Russian accent, that it wasn't an actual like separate uh, language of its own. So yeah, and I mean, and I grew up just totally, I was totally American because I grew up, in, I was born in the US, but but yeah, it's not, I mean, it's a really common story. Yes, and it's interesting because after the United States, oh, the United States, after the Soviet Union was formed and uh, sort of the Soviet ideology was instilled in Ukraine, very slowly, but surely, a lot of the Ukrainian um, sort of important cultural identities, leaders, and sort of talented people, their uh, histories were slowly erased. I was just recently at a concert by a um, duet, sort of a piano and violin performers that performed lost Ukrainian music. And I'm like, what is this lost Ukrainian music? I went to music school, you know, I finished like played piano for eight years in Ukraine. And there's composers I've never heard of because their names were erased from the curriculum after Soviet Union came to power because they were too Ukrainian or they fled the Soviet Union to go to Europe and they were not allowed to be performed and so on and so forth. So like Tchaikovsky and Prokofiev and Shostakovich, fabulous composers, but those are the names that we know, not the Ukrainian composers who were not allowed to be spoken about. <laughs> So it was a systematic erase uh, mm. effort to erase the culture. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so now I will get to, we have uh, one to get to the, some of the questions. We have some pretty meaty questions from that some of our participants had submitted when they registered. And uh, the first one I have here is wondering about the state of the Ukrainian economy and how it can, uh, just whether it's strong enough to sustain the war, how it's going to end up? Well, Ukraine has received so much help. So yes, is it strong enough to sustain the war? Absolutely. But could it do it on its own? Absolutely not. <laughs> so the, with the help it's getting, yes. The trouble is that a lot of the Western companies that were working inside Ukraine had to stop 
functioning, certainly in the East or some other country, some other parts of the country. I don't know if they're trickling back to Kiev because technically there is a war going on. So even though it might some, like for example, the consulates and the embassies have returned to Kiev, right? Um, some private companies might not want to. So has the, the economy been affected 100%? Uh, are they able to survive this? Yes. I think the amazing thing, and I'm not trying to like toot Ukraine's horn, it just really surprised me personally and a lot of people here, is how people have uh, inside Ukraine mobilized to help those around them who have been affected. Meaning that if you, they lost their jobs, they've become volunteers. Uh, me, uh, trying to get goods from the West Ukraine to the East. Um, and I'm not saying everyone's a saint, of course not, but so many have changed their lives to try to help these efforts so that I, I think just their spirit has shown that they're able to rebuild and change things and um, eventually the country will be stronger now. When that is, I do not know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so, and our uh, someone had an interesting question about maritime routes. Um, that if there are any actions underway to establish any routes from Odessa um, and other Black Sea ports for exporting grain. So yes, uh, Odessa, as I showed you on the map, in the very south on the Black Sea of Ukraine, is a very important port. Always has been. Actually, since the time of uh, Odessa was established by Catherine the Great, and uh, was a very important economic city with incredibly um, uh, favorable conditions for Europeans to work in. And um, the city has been blockaded by both Ukraine and Russia on two sort of edges of the sea. Um, Ukraine has put in a lot of mines in the water because the mines are preventing the Russian ships of getting closer to bomb the city, right? Because it's a really big city and uh, one that Russia would love to take. Uh, the Russia blockades a little further away because they don't want any ships to get to or from to bring weapons to Ukraine. So there's a lot of diplomatic efforts um, going on trying to figure out how to get the grain out, right? Because Ukraine provides a lot of the grain for many different countries. I think the numbers are like staggering, like 80% of Egypt's grain or something like that. I, I, again, I don't remember the numbers. I'm not an economics expert, but <clears throat> some countries are in big trouble because of this. And another country that grows a lot of uh, wheat uh, for example, India, they had a big drought. So they actually closed their borders to ex exporting the grain. Saying, We're going to need it for ourselves. So it's not just Ukraine with the, its blockade. It's other countries that are also realizing they're going to have shortages um, that are making changes. All of that is like even as far as Mexico, people are realizing that this is going to affect them. So I have a thank you for this question ahead of time. I looked into it today. And there are diplomatic efforts. Uh, Russia said that if Ukraine removes the uh, mines from the water and allows our ships to inspect all the ships that are want to enter the Odessa port, we will allow them to remove the grain. Will that happen? No, because A, Ukraine needs the mines to protect the city, right? Or at least that's what they say. And um, Russia and Ukraine will not submit to inspection of ships, right? Because that just doesn't sound reasonable during the time of war. So uh, between those two things, will the grain be removed? Well, there is a uh, border with Moldova, another country sort of to the side. It's, if you're looking at the map of Ukraine, it's on the west, southwest of the, of the map. Uh, but the land route is obviously longer. Um, the grain, the grain is going to uh, spoil if it's not removed over time. So will they find another route? I think whenever there's economic interests of big countries involved, yes, they will find a way to do this. But right now, I think there's a lot, it's gonna be a lot of back and forth to try to figure out what to do. Yeah, that's something I hadn't even um, thought of. Um, another, a uh, question is relates back to what you had talked about earlier about the population and how many people have been displaced. Um, but uh, wondering, 
how many um, Ukrainians are left in Ukraine and how are they keeping themselves safe? Uh, how are they keeping themselves safe? Well, um, I can't speak for everyone. In some places, I know people were staying inside basements for a very long time. Like, for example, my husband and I uh, have been helping people inside Ukraine. So, like, we'll talk to someone and say, oh, our so-and-so, like, soldiers came upon this kindergarten, which has a big basement. So they moved a lot of senior citizens there from upper floors. floors. So they're living there and it's like really tough conditions. They need X, Y, Z. So like, you know, people help them out. Um, so that's one of the ways to keep yourself safe. If you're in the area that gets bombed, you move into a basement, right? Because that's a little safer. I know that my husband's um, high school to which, it, and in Ukraine, schools are not really elementary, middle and high school. Most schools are from first to 12th grade in the same building they're just sort of um, smaller schools in terms of number but uh, the school that he went to had a very big um, basement which became an official bomb shelter not just for the kids to come to but uh, other people as well so that's number one uh, a lot of people moved from east to west of ukraine a lot of people have left ukraine altogether and right now it's mostly women and children. Men are not allowed to leave Ukraine unless they're over 60 years old or younger than 18 because they want men of fighting age to stay. Um, you know, my, my father is, again, just another example. I'm trying to speak of people I know. He never went to a bomb shelter. Nope, he's turning 70 in, my goodness, July 11th in four days. And he said, nope, I'm fine. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> His wife, um, my stepmom, she went into a bomb shelter, into the basement a couple of times. But then like they both said, we're just going to stay. I mean, it's just sirens. Their building didn't get bombed. It's a couple of like blocks away. There was one uh, rocket. But how do people stay safe? They're trying to stay sane. I think that's the number one thing. They're trying to focus on what they need to get done. And um, I have a friend who lives in Kharkiv and her um, apartment is fine, but the area where she used to live got really, really bumped out, like all the buildings around are damaged. Um, so she moved into sort of countryside, right? Like in the Ridgewood area of her city. So it's like a bit of a um, sort of smaller cabin in the woods area. So people are trying to leave populated big areas when they can, and move to smaller areas. But then again, around Kiev, there's smaller villages that get completely destroyed. So are you safe really anywhere? It's hard to say. Oh boy. Um, and also if anybody in the um, audience has any questions, please um, feel free to add them to the Q&A too. Um, uh, so the last one that I uh, submitted questions I had was um, if there, I mean, this is a sort of hopeful question. Um, are there any plans for reconstruction, for post-war uh, reconstruction? Well, you know, it's interesting. I can tell you, yes, in my family, there are. My husband said, whenever the war is over, we're going to, on vacation to Ukraine and we're going to help rebuild. So I'm going to bet so many people will do that. And not just those who were born in Ukraine like me. It's going to be a lot of people just like, uh, you know, Peace Corps kind of a movement from around the world. I have no doubt. Inside Ukraine, it's interesting. I've seen examples where people are rebuilding during the war because they're saying this is not going to destroy us. We're going to get through this. We're going to be strong. And they're going inside, like even in this number two city, I keep mentioning Kharkiv, because that's where we have a lot of connections, thanks to my husband. And we're getting firsthand information instead of just reading it in the news. So like I've seen people saying, OK, well, we cannot have glass in our windows, so we'll have wooden panels, not a problem. And we'll just use them. They are reopening offices. They're trying to do the best they can. They have summer camps. I mean, it's, it's surreal to think of your child going to a summer camp where there's bombs and sirens and all that stuff, but they're trying to, trying to continue. I'm really worried about education for in September because this, if the kids don't go back to school in some areas, this will set them back, not only psychologically, but then, you know, obviously education-wise. So a lot of uh, humanitarian work has been to try to help the kids right um but you know there's some efforts already underway 
Well, especially considering that, I mean, just there was a global pandemic before this too, and that was already impacting education of so many millions of kids too. That's, and, you know, I had a question about the, the uh, Ukrainian flag. It's a really interesting design and it is, doesn't seem to bear any re resemblance to the Russian flag too, which I'm guessing was purposeful, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the origin of the flag. Because, Well, I mean, honestly, I'm trying to think, uh, when did it become the, I don't know the date when the flag became, I know that the uh, Soviet Ukrainian flag always had the blue line on top and the red. So it was, I think all the republics had like a small line of some other color and then the red flag uh, to show that we're communist republics. Uh, so definitely when Ukraine became independent, the two colors represent the blue sky of Ukraine and the yellow grain of Ukraine. So that's like the, just to show how connected people are to their land, to their grain, to their farms. It always has been a land, uh, or a country connected to the land. Um, and, and uh, oh, Ansi uh, has an interesting comment here that she's talking about the theater of war um, is having a Ukrainian project on July 16th. I'm not sure what theater of war is, but it's, oh, it's a wonderful theater on Zoom. So if, oh, at um, info at theaterofwar.com. So thank you, Ansi, for putting that in the chat. That's in the chat. Um, and if anybody has any other ideas about any uh, other resources to share, I know that, um, Anastasia, you had a couple of um, ideas, you had a couple of places that you wanted to mention, I think at least one. Uh, right, so, well, uh, one of the coping mechanisms for me and my husband has been trying to help Ukraine or people displaced by the war. So uh, a friend, another Ridgewood mom and I, and with the help of many, many other people have organized a free store for Ukrainian refugees. It's in Ridgewood thanks to the generosity of so many people who have donated. And I'm going to share the flyer of what it looks like um, in a second. But basically the store is um, in the basement of St. Elizabeth Church. And this church uh, has allowed us to display um, materials that people might need when they're moving to another country because a lot of people have been traveling through Eastern Europe and they could only take like a small suitcase. So there's toiletries, there is used and new clothes assorted by size and so on. Um, there is linens and towels and uh, toys for kids. There's even now like car seats and so on. So we've set up the times when um, the volunteers are there. They're mostly Tuesdays and Wednesdays for an hour and a half in the morning and the evening. However, we can always make arrangements to be there on the weekend um, when necessary. So if you know any refugee families anywhere that you want to take advantage of these free resources, please direct them to St. Elizabeth Church because that's where this uh, free store is. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes people ask me like, how can we help Ukraine? Well, you know, America is doing so much, right? We have these trillions of dollars in aid going. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that is big machinery or big guns, so to speak, that are very needed to defend the country. But I think um, to help the people who just are trying to improve their way of life, like um, there's a lot of uh, grassroots campaigning going on to send help. There's a lot of organizations trying to help like United for Ukraine or Razum. Razum means together in Ukrainian. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like big companies like Red Cross, for example, because their budgets, uh, a lot of the money go towards bureaucracy or other, you know, ways to. So I, I sort of prefer smaller companies if you know of so, and you can always search and I'm happy to provide that if necessary. But um, almost sometimes I think it's better if you know someone, like I donate money to people that have relatives in Ukraine that are making a difference. So this way I know the money is going to a person instead of getting lost in the system somewhere. Uh, we have been doing a lot of sort of organizing charity events and uh, buying like prenatal vitamins and generators and, you know, gosh, 
baby beds for hospitals and things like that, just because we know the chief doctors within the hospital and they send us pictures and we are have the accountability of where the money is going to. So there's things like that, that, that you can get involved in. I'm always happy to provide more information, but I don't think anyone should feel guilty about not helping either because just by learning about Ukraine and being involved, like attending a class, um, a workshop like this, um, that's already doing so much. So thank you to everyone who had listened. And also remember, if you want to, that one of the best ways you can help is just by being really careful about the information you share on social media um, to check your sources, just to make sure that you check yourself. Is this story just there? Is it, am I feeling outraged and angry? Um, because we know that uh, Facebook, uh, the Facebook algorithm rewards uh, stories that cre uh, create a negative emotion because those tend to get the most attention. So if, uh, just one of the best things that we can do is just to make sure that we're sharing accurate information and that we, uh, if we have any doubts about something, we can always decline to share it. That's always the best um, uh, response to that. And I and I know that this was a, a really difficult to, subject to um, talk about that I just uh, as we wrap up and first thank you everybody too for attending we'll be posting the recording on our YouTube channel soon. Um, hearing about how the war is affecting just average people as they go about their lives um, and you know hearing that you are helping to pay for and deliver um, baby beds and incubators that that is not something that we usually think about um, and it does really bring home the human impact of this war also and how absolutely I don't know, there's not a, I can't think of another word, but just unnecessary that this all is, that life could just be normal now. Um, but, it, you know, people are having babies and um, they still need surgery, even just for regular, uh, people are still um, having chemotherapy for cancer and things like that. And um, what has been, what you've been really supporting people just to get through life. Yeah, you know, well, hard to hear. It is definitely a very strange thing to live in the United States and have all our luxuries and gosh, you know, we know we're lucky in Ridgewood um, and to then get on the phone and talk to people who are, are volunteering to go defend their country and the country, Ukraine just doesn't have the money like we have been talking about the economy. Yes, the economy will rebuild. Yes, the offices and companies will reopen. But right now, those volunteers are going to fight in, you know, old sneakers because they don't have military boots or they don't have enough sort of gear like a medical kit or even, you know, pliers or, my goodness, what do they call the, um, anything that United States soldiers will always have to go when they're going to combat, Ukrainian soldiers do not. Um, some units do, you know, there's always going to be a special unit that will look really cool. Um, but when we talk about volunteers from big towns, they really don't. Like we have been sending uh, every two weeks, there's a shipment of about 30 boxes that we've been sending with uh, clothes for the soldiers. And a lot of it has been donated by um, American soldiers who are either in reserves and their uniform is now um, outdated or by people who are just, you know, exited military. I have made a new friend on Facebook. It is unbelievable. I, mean, I told you about this um, yesterday, Larissa, that this gentleman from South Carolina, I've never met him. We've become Facebook friends because he's an ex-military, American military medic. And he sent me his uniform saying the boys in Ukraine needed more. So this is one of the things I've been doing. My husband and I have been making flyers, spreading them any way we can, grassroots. You got a uniform, send it to me and I will ship it to Ukraine. So we raise money to ship all these things because it's very expensive to ship. Um, so yes, that, that stuff is very tough, but hey, I have yoga, <laughs> I have family and uh, you know, life is here, but help is there. Well, thank you so much, Anastasia, for sharing uh, yourself again with us tonight. Please take care of yourself and your family. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this evening. Like I said, I'll put the recording up as soon as I can onto YouTube. And I hope you all have a lovely evening. Take care. And I and I hope happy birthday to your dad. Uh, thank you.
Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.